37 of the stand, right here in Tampa, Florida. Give Jesus a great big hand clap one more time. Before you're seated, lift both hands to the Lord. Father, we just join our faith together, both here and on Facebook and YouTube, that you would pour out your spirit anew and afresh on this new generation. In Jesus' name. And I pray you would use me tonight, flow through me, to give out what you've put in me. That there would be a new generation of people who know their God and do exploits in his name. In Jesus' name. I pray for everybody who's online. Everybody who's watching on television. I pray that whatever their issue of concern is, I pray for those that are sick watching in the hospital. I pray that as I preach your word, your power would come and destroy every yoke of bondage in Jesus' name. I thank you for it and I give you praise. We give you honor and we give you glory. We set our faith for the 31 days of this month to be the greatest 31 days we've ever seen. In Jesus' name. We thank you for it and we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Give the Lord another great hand clap and you can be seated. I want you, if you have your Bible, to open it with me to Romans chapter 16. Romans, the 16th chapter. Then once you get to 16, go a little to the left. I'm going to read out of 15. 15, verse 16. Romans 15, verse 16. Paul said, I'm a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I brought you the gospel so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God made holy by the Holy Spirit. So I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message. Everybody say, my message. Then he said, and by the way that I worked among them. They were convinced by the power of the miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way have I fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he said, in this way have I fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which way? By bringing them the message and by working among them in signs and wonders. Turn to 1 Corinthians, one book over to the right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Paul said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to we who are being saved, we know the message is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world to look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. It's foolish to the Jews who ask for a sign from heaven, and it's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God, and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are wise in the world's eyes or powerful 
or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no man can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us from all sin. Say that out loud. Jesus has made me free, has made me holy, and has made me pure. That's why I can't get with people. How many of you know we're all sinners? Speak for yourself. When Jesus died, his blood, according to the Bible, made me free from sin. Not struggling with sin. Free from sin. Holy as Christ is holy. Not a separate holiness. The same holiness and pure. If you're thankful for that, can you say amen? amen. That's what the Bible says. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I did not use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Ghost. I did this so you would not put your trust in man's wisdom, but that your faith would rest in the power of God. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, just over a little more to the right. First Thessalonians 1 verse 5. First Thessalonians, the first chapter, the fifth verse. For when we brought you the gospel, it was not with words only, but with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. Look at the first part of verse 5. When we brought you the gospel, it was not in word only, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that the things we were saying was true. So the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. There's three, and you could read a lot more. That Paul actually taught it as a doctrine that until the manifestation of God's power has come behind the teaching and preaching of the word, you've not preached the full gospel. In the last scripture we read, Paul said, we did this so your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but that your faith would rest in the power of God. That when you see God in action, it does something for your faith biblically. And I know I'm probably the first person most of you watching online have ever heard say, well, we just trust in, in the word. We, Paul didn't teach that. Paul said, when we brought you the word, we didn't come with just the word, but we made sure that the power of the Holy Spirit moved to show that the word was true. How many of you heard what Pastor Rodney just said about that old evangelist that's putting his tent up? And he, I guess he just put it up in Michigan, and then now he's putting it up in Maine, two states that are far from open. You know, it's, it's a pretty dicey time to go do a meeting anywhere right now, but Maine's like, you know, Maine and Michigan, Michigan, you know about that lady, I don't even think she's... Well, let's just keep staying in the Bible tonight. <laughs> so he's 82. You know, you know what you have to be to preach a tent meeting when you're 32, let alone 82? A tent traps the heat. Tents are like 120 degrees when you preach under it in the summer. And then, uh, then he's 82. Well, that guy is friends with my family. He's from, from uh, rural Virginia. You know the gift that God gave him? One time we were talking about it. My uncle, my uncle Ted's friends with him, and we were at a place in Holton, Maine that sells pie. We were visiting my uncle Ted's grandmother, my great-grandmother, Louise. 
So we went to go see her, and then we left her house and went to go get some pie at this place in this little town in Maine. And all of a sudden, my uncle starts talking about this evangelist that Pastor Rodney brought up. And all of a sudden, that guy walks in as we're talking to him. He doesn't live in Maine. He doesn't live anywhere near Maine. And he went, Brother Ted, Lord told me you were here, and I wanted to come have a meal with you. So I grew up around guys like that. When that guy calls people out in the spirit, like you hear when I call somebody out, I say, like, you in the jacket or you in the tan pants. I've been in meetings with that guy where, like, 30 people a night, He'll call out every single person by their first name, your name, and tell them they've never been to the church before. Do you know what that does? Paul said when you see that, you know, I remember being 11 years old and thinking, shoot, this is real. There really is a God where he'd say your, your name is Tim. And the doctor said you have a growth in your neck. Tim, in the name of Jesus, that growth is out of your neck now in Jesus' name. And the guy shake his head and cry. You know, he's blown away. The Bible says there's to be a power that comes behind the gospel. And I'll tell you another thing. If you've been to Las Vegas, which uh, not really the best preacher analogy for church, but I've already let it out of the mouth, so might as well stay with it. You know, they, got, they, have, they have magicians in residency. Everybody knows they're not doing real magic. Everybody knows it's fake and they just can't figure it out. And they pack out two shows a night, six nights a week, five nights a week. Because man was bred for the supernatural. Man was created in the image of God. The Bible says in Genesis 1, in his image and in his likeness created he them. Can you say amen? amen? So man has a longing for the supernatural. And I wanted to deal, I've never preached this before tonight, but God began to stir this in my spirit late last night and then all this afternoon. Because there never would have been, it would have taken until about the last 15 years for the government to announce a shutdown of churches and every church comply. I'll tell you right now, if somebody would have told me in January that they were going to tell all churches to shut down and I had to guess, how many do you think will comply with the government order? I would have said, you know, conservatively, at least 30% of the churches would stay open. I would have thought in Texas, you would have had a minimum of 20,000 churches just stay open, not even because they have faith, just because they're Texans and don't like being told what to do. I never, I never would have thought that, ba you know, basically it would just be you could count them on one hand. The one lawyer that represented our ministry said, we were looking for a pastor to represent because this is so unconstitutional. Uh, it's an open and shut case, but we haven't been able to find anybody to, rep to represent. There was hardly anybody that stood against it. So you had these churches shut down, and I want those of you that are in the ministry, you're either going to get mad or you're going to get a ministry tonight that works in the last days. But you should listen to what I'm going to say. Because you notice that it wasn't only that they complied with a, a tyrannical government unconstitutional order that violates the First Amendment two different ways. But that you started to hear pe people say stuff like, the Bible says, the main commandment is we're to love our neighbor, amen. And right now, loving our neighbor means making sure that everybody's healthy. Well, you know what that revealed? That revealed that people did not understand a cardinal doctrine of the Bible called divine healing. That Jesus is a healer, God the Father is a healer, and the Holy Ghost brings healing and liberty everywhere that he goes. And so I wanted to address it tonight, because rather than just say shame on everybody for shutting down, clearly there's been a generation of ministers raised that obviously we're never around a guy like Brother Freddie Clark that I was mentioning. And want to know why I've gravitated to guys like that? What's he still doing at 83? He's putting a tent up in Bangor and preaching the gospel. I've watched the people that are ashamed of the power of God, and they retire at 58, 62. You know, my Uncle Ted will be on doing a Facebook Live. They're all watching him because their ministries are over. They quit. Retired at 50, retired at 55, whatever. But these guys that stay with the Holy Ghost, their ministries actually gain relevance as, as they age. Two Fridays ago, where were we? We were on the field listening to Kenneth Copeland preach at 83 years old. Do you know how hot it was that day? It broke the Florida record. It was 99 degrees. Who knows how hot it was on the field? And at 83, he sang like three songs, 
preached for two hours, prayed for the whole crowd. I made up my mind. I've seen the other flow, and I've seen the flow of the Holy Ghost. And the flow of the Holy Ghost is not only what will help you, it's the only thing that's going to help this broken and hurting world that's lost without an answer. They don't just need a cute message. They need the power of God. And God will anoint you to give that to them in Jesus' name. So I've, I've been thinking, if people were willing to shut down their church, and I'm telling you, it wasn't all because they were afraid to get sued. <laughs> you, had the, you know, wasn't it pretty amazing that they said, all churches have to be shut down, and so they said, okay, we'll shut down because Romans 13. Then the president said, I'm asking all churches to open up immediately without restriction, and all of the churches that quoted Romans 13 now said, well, actually, it's our decision. When, what happened to Romans 13? The government just told you to open back up. So sooner or later, you have to just admit that somewhere along the way, you lost, you lost your spine. You're afraid. And, 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 get, and Christian leaders can say whatever they want. You know, we need to be careful, and we want to care for our people. Look, no one's forcing anyone at gunpoint to go to church. No one's shaming anyone for not coming. But I, I'm, I get to go behind the curtain, you know. I'm with the preachers after the microphones are shut off. And I can tell you one that has one of the largest churches in the country. He's supposed to be at a conference, and he said, I'm not getting on a plane and risking my life to come to that conference with this going on right now. He said, I I'm an older man. I'm at risk to these things. So do you know what that shows you? That, and that's a full gospel preacher. So you know what that shows you is that somewhere along the way, people have not had the word of God sown into them in the area of divine healing and miracles. And I wanted to open up with the scriptures I opened up with because it shows you that Paul did not treat that as a side thing. Paul, in fact, told right up front, remember when I brought you the gospel, I did not come with word only or excellency of speech, but I came in the demonstration of the power of God. And so, if that's the problem, if you've gone from the 1960s and 70s and 80s where there were healing campaigns all the time. My mother used to go to a place, uh, you had that lady testifying from Bible college, from Pittsburgh. There's a place in Pittsburgh called Soldiers and Sailors. Uh, uh, it's, it's like a, a, an, an arena, like an old style arena. Kenneth Hagin used to come there. Brother Shambuck used to come there. Catherine Kuhlman would do a miracle service the first Friday of every month in Pittsburgh. 2,000, 2,500, 3,500 people pray for people in wheelchairs. And if we were honest, many of us grew up in churches. You never saw anybody. You not only never saw a miracle, you never even saw anybody exercise their faith for a miracle. I drove by a church where I live in Pennsylvania. And the sign out front of the church said, we're beginning a four-part series, uh, what to do when your prayers don't get answered. And I thought when I saw that, think how much better the next four services would be if instead of saying we're going to cover what to do when your prayers don't get answered, if you taught how to have prayers that bring answers. And so rather than get mad and bash people for being losers and, and, and not doing what they're supposed to do, why not just begin to teach and preach and demonstrate the power of God in this area of divine healing? Because if there was ever a generation that needed to see that there's a God that can lift depression off of you, there's a God that can break suicide off of you, there's a God that can dry up cancerous tumors, there's a God that opens the deaf ear, there's a God that makes the blind eye to see this generation needs to see that and God wants to use you to bring that to them can you say amen and so why 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 would people become so weak in divine healing that they'd shut their church down because they're fearful well I thought of all the reasons and I'm going to give them to you number one Turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91, 1. The 91st Psalm, the first verse. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. 
This I declare of the Lord. He alone is my refuge and my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Don't dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, and ten thousand are dying all around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Verse 7, though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand are dying all around you, these evils will not touch you. And I want you to notice there's nowhere we're in parentheses that says, but also remember God expects you to use wisdom. Doesn't say that. In fact, I read that God's wisdom is higher. God's foolishness is higher than the highest of man's wisdom. Because I've heard every knucklehead preacher during the last 10 weeks, and I'm, frankly, if you can't tell, I've had enough. Well, we don't, run, we don't run stoplights and quote Psalm 91, do we? Psalm 91 wasn't written for running stoplights, stupid. It was specifically written for people that are operating in a time when there's plagues. Plagues means incurable sickness and disease. And if you study church history in the United States, when the Spanish flu was going on, when Hong Kong flu was going on in uh, 1963, right around there, people put their tents up, tuberculosis, and had nights where you could bring those people to pray for them so they could be healed. That's how some of the biggest Pentecostal churches that are in America were built. When the other ones were shut down, they said, bring the sick. Because you know what Jesus did? Jesus didn't say, keep the sick away. Jesus didn't have Peter with a temperature gun making sure everyone was under 99 degrees to get to the meeting. They brought unto him all the sick. They brought unto him all the sick. And no matter what their sickness or what their disease or if they were possessed by evil spirits, one touch from his hand healed them all. And he said the same work, the same work that you see me do, you shall do and greater. For I go to the Father on your behalf. Hi. My name's Pastor Sam Nichols. Many of you know we're going through. Hi, my name's Sam Nichols. As many of you know, we've been going through a very trying time in our, in our world right now. Many are asking, when are we gonna be meeting again? Well, that's a delicate question. But after meeting with the leadership of this church, we've come to the decision that right now it might be best to move our services online till the year 2023, 2024. Maybe I have a different view of Jesus. I can't picture him making that announcement. Hi, my name's Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, as many of you know me. As you know, leprosy has become a very serious disease. And it's very contagious. And so we're just asking, until we get this leprosy under control, we're just going to come in compliance with Pilate and the Roman government. Just ask you to keep your leprous rear end at home. Until we get this thing under control. You can come see me at JesusOfNazareth.com. How does a shepherd abandon the sheep when the sheep are going through the worst time they've ever had? 
There's one county in Indiana that averages a thousand calls a week or a month to their suicide hotline, and in April they had 25,000 calls. 25 times the normal call. Anybody see the videos when they'd go to pick up the bottles? For the, when the recycling guy would come by in the neighborhood? Just piled with liquor bottles. Every neighborhood. The drug relapses, the drug overdoses through the roof. Can you imagine if you were coming out of a drug problem in March and they tell you that everything's shut down and you probably have like a 10% chance you're going to die? I mean, let's be honest. Most of us are born-again Christians and we thought about doing drugs for a few days. <laughs> Let alone if they're telling you your job's closed down, we're on the verge of war with China, and then your online church is telling you how to make recipes for your family and games you can play during the shutdown. Did you know America right now is overripe for a revival? Yeah. Who, you, you all saw the girl from this church that went to the protest and began to preach and the whole crowd gave their life to Jesus Christ. People aren't riding out there because the devil's taken over. People are, you're, what you're seeing happen in the countries of the earth right now, you're seeing it happen because the church has vacated their role. And nature abhors vacuum. If the church steps out, darkness moves in. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You're what keeps the earth from rotting. But if the salt loses its savor, how do you make it salty again? My friend, I want to tell you, we're not here on this earth to play religious games and have a cute 28 minute message where all the points start with the same letter and a video clip in between each one to break it up. We are charged to carry the power of God to a hurting, dying generation and rescue the dying and care for the suffering. Verse 9. Psalm 91, 9. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. Say it out loud. No evil, no evil. will conquer me. No plague will come near your home. And what's plague mean in the Bible? Incurable sickness and disease. COVID-19 is not the first thing that hit like that. It won't be the last. They just said bubonic plague broke out on the China-Mongolian border today. Hopefully they can get it contained. They said, oh, that's great that the fate of the world rests in you hopefully being able to get it contained. Jesus said before he comes back, not there'll be less and less plagues. He said there'll be more and more. So if you're going to shut down and hide every time there's bad news, you're going to be shut down a lot before the rapture. God is looking for men and women that believe his word, that will stand in the face of the devil and say no. No evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what they would respond in a poll. I would say 85 plus percent, if not 90 plus percent of preachers do not believe those verses. They don't believe you can stand on that, that no plague will come near my home, that if a thousand are dying on my one side and 10,000 are dropping dead all around me, these evils will not touch me. Did Jesus touch the leper or did Jesus tell the leper to back up? Because Jesus was the word of God incarnate. No deadly thing will come near you. I don't believe that. You said, well, you need to use wisdom. There's no wisdom that cancels out what God clearly said. None. They don't believe in angelic protection. I was talking to a missionary on the Texas-Mexico border when I was in my late 20s. And he's a good guy. You know, anybody, anybody that would leave the United States to go start a missions work in rural Mexico, in cartel country, and stay there for 25 years, 
They're not in it for anything but to help people. And then, you know, if somebody stays there in cartel country, and this guy couldn't have blended in any less. He was from Alabama, and he looked like a white guy from Alabama. In fact, it was funny because he was fluent in Spanish, but he spoke Spanish with an Alabama accent. It was the funniest thing. Buenos dias, sir. <laughs> Como esta? Como esta ustedes? So it's not like he blended in. So he said this one place that they went, the village was famous for murder. And the Lord told him to go and do a meeting there. And hardly anybody came the first night because uh, they were afraid to get murdered. People didn't want to come out at, at night. So he did the meeting, hardly anybody there. They went back to the pastor's house. Because I always ask guys like that. You know, I've been in the ministry 25 years in a dangerous place. I'll say, what's the greatest miracle you've ever seen God do? They mean, they'll say, like, what do you mean? I said, in the service or any. For your life or in a service, what's the greatest miracle that you've ever seen God do? And he, he was there with his wife and kids, and they all said the same thing. They said, when we were leaving that meeting that night, we went back to the pastor's house to eat dinner. And the pastor, when we finished dinner, said, if I were you, I wouldn't stay here very long. I'd get back to wherever, wherever you're going because it's very dangerous at night. So he said, we got in a vehicle. As we're driving out late at night, they have, there's one road out. The whole road's blocked. They have rocks across the road with guys with machetes and machine guns waiting for them because they heard a guy came into the town and uh, they're going to get him on the way out. So as he sees it driving up to, up to the barricade, rocks, not like police barricades or whatever, rocks. He said, I'm driving and I just said, Jesus, help me. And he said, I heard a voice say, don't stop, accelerate. So he accelerates and he said, I just figured, you know, the Lord didn't say he was going to save him, he just said accelerate. He's like, well, I guess maybe the Lord wants me to crash my car and we'll all die that way <laughs> rather than then dice us to pieces. And he said, I accelerated, and when we got to the rocks, and all his daughters were there, shaking their head yes, with their eyes like glassy with tears, and the wife, they said, we all closed our eyes and braced for impact, and we never hit anything. They said, we looked, and we, we, we went through it somehow. And when they came back to do the meeting the next night, that's how you know a man of God. You have the people set you up to butcher you, and then you come back. You know, they stoned, they dragged Paul out of the city and stoned him to death. They gathered around to bury him, and he pocked popped up out of the rocks and walked back into the city to preach. That, that's the DNA that we come from. That's the DNA that's on the inside of you if you'll tap into it. Can you say amen? amen. So when he came back that night, tons of people out. The cartel was there. Because if you give God the chance, God will work with signs and wonders to show you're not some American missionary. You're not some Bible college graduate that got too hopped up on coffee in the Bible and wants to spread it to everybody. You are a messenger from God to your generation. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus, from tonight, signs and wonders will follow you to confirm the word that God has entrusted you to preach to your generation. If you receive that, take 15 good seconds, clap those hands, and give God the mightiest shout of praise. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. He will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They'll hold you up with your, their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras and you'll crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I'll rescue those who love me. I'll protect those who trust in my name. Listen to that. The Lord. Who said it? Can you trust what the Lord says? Is this a book of God's word? Or is this a book of encouraging phrases that you're not really meant to take seriously? It's God's word. This is God's word to you in print. If you can't believe this part, why believe the heaven part? You don't believe God can keep you safe and healthy like you said, but you believe you have a mansion in heaven in another galaxy? You have mental problems. Do 
Do you know when they closed all the churches down, there's a comedian that I like. He's not a Christian yet. I've been praying for him, though. I was glad I listened to his one podcast recently, and he said, I started reading the Bible, so we're making progress. But he said, I heard all the churches are closing down. He said, I thought you guys believed in Jesus, and he healed the blind. Aren't you guys supposed to believe that you healed that bad word? And I thought, yeah. He, he, he knows. As an unbeliever, it caught him weird that Christians were afraid of a virus. They're afraid. It's not wisdom. The highest wisdom there is is faith. And faith and fear look nothing alike. Faith attacks the problem. Faith doesn't hide from the problem. I will rescue those who love me. Not I might rescue. I will rescue. Ask that guy that speaks Spanish in an Alabama accent. I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I mean, you know, sometimes God feels like he doesn't answer. Who cares what it feels like? He said, when you call on me, I will answer. I'll be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will reward them with long life. I turned 40 in September. That's not long. So that lets me know I'm not dying anytime soon. How many of you know we could all die tomorrow? Not we. If you want to say me, say me. Don't say we. Because I'm not dying. I already made up my mind. Not today, also not tomorrow. Yeah, but Jonathan, the Bible says none of us are promised tomorrow because the rapture could happen. But if the rapture doesn't happen, I'll be right here. And any devil that thinks otherwise can watch me prove them wrong for the next 40 years. Because God said, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. I will reward them with long life and show them my salvation. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. What was the early church like? Acts 5, 12. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. So they were performing many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers were meeting how often? Were they allowed to meet? No, they weren't. They were, they were told to not preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. And they were meeting regularly together doing it. They weren't saying, at this time, until, the, until Constantinople, uh, until Constantine takes over, it's probably not for the next 300 years the best idea to meet in large groups. So we've decided on the apostolic leadership team, maybe we'll just go online for a little while. Everybody say meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colony, but no one else dared join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow perhaps might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. How many? All. Turn to Exodus 15. Why were they all healed? Exodus 15, 22. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. Praise God. When they came to the oasis of Mara, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help. And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. 
Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. D.L. Moody said that that wood was a type of the cross. When he threw it in the water that was, that was full of virus and bacteria and whatever else that made, it, made them sick if they tried to drink it, it was there at Mara that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight. So what are the conditions? If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord. Everybody say, I will. I will. And do what is right in his sight. Everybody say, I do. I do. Then I will not allow you to suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who healeth thee. I will not allow you to, all of the diseases that you saw come on your Egyptian captors, not all heal you when you get them. I won't allow any of those diseases to come upon you. For I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals thee. Turn to Exodus 23. Turn to Exodus 23. Exodus 23, 24. I'll start at 20, 22. I won't look up any higher than that. Exodus 23, 22. But if you're careful to obey God, everybody say, I will. <laughs> Following all my instructions, everybody say, I will. <laughs> you know, and the instructions aren't hard to follow. Go to church. Pay your tithe. Don't kill anybody. Don't sleep with anybody you're not married to. Don't steal from anybody. Jesus said you can sum it all up in two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Because what, six of the commandments deal with how you treat other people and four deal with your honor towards God. If you love people like you love you, you're not going to punch them in the face. You won't shoot them even if they're from a different political party. <laughs> you won't do it. All the stuff, the insane things you see people doing, you never would do it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. This fulfills everything that's written in the law and the prophets. Easiest thing in the world to do. Can't get me to punch a police officer. Can't get me to punch somebody who threatened me. You know, I'm going to have just as a joke, we had so many people because we kept preaching in April when people were like freaked out about coronavirus and thought you were going to like you know, you were going to kill everybody if you had church. We had to take our phones off the hook for, <laughs> for three days because so many people called in death threats. I'm actually going to get tomorrow in the office. If they're watching, I'm not joking around. Like, get it set up tomorrow. Where when you call our office, it's going to say, like, to speak to the receptionist, press one. If you want to speak to finance, press two. If you're interested in booking Jonathan for a meeting, press three. If you're calling to make a death threat against Jonathan's life, please press four for scheduling. <laughs> But if you're care, even those people that did that, all the people that called up, all the people that commented on Facebook that have a profile picture of a wolf with glowing green eyes. I wish you were dead. I wish your face didn't have a mouth so you couldn't say anything. That's a creative way of telling someone you wish they'd shut up. Even those people. I wish them all the best. I'm not mad at any one of them. They all have fake names anyway, so even if I wanted to be mad, who could I even be mad at? Everybody say love. love. Yeah, when Jesus, when you receive Jesus, the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. When that one young lady stood up at that riot in Tampa and preached to everybody with the bullhorn, that's probably the first time those people have ever heard love in anybody's voice. I have shouting and angry. And someone said, hey, I want you to know Jesus loves you. What? Where'd this lady come from? Everybody say love. love. Say faith works, by love. faith works by love. It's hard to get people saved that you hate. You need to get saved. <laughs> you need to become a Christian so you can know what true joy is. <laughs> For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land so you may live there. And I will destroy your enemies completely. But you must not worship the gods of these nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. 
Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. You must serve only the Lord your God. And if you do, everybody say, I will. Then God said, I will bless your bread and water. And I will take sickness and disease out of your midst. There will be no infertility or miscarriages among you. And I will give you long, full lives. Come on, say long, full lives. Do you know what putting up a tent in the middle of summer in humid Bangor, Maine, and preaching two hours a night and praying for the sick? That's not just a long life, that's a full life. He doesn't even have any other ministers with him to take the load. He's leading worship, he plays the banjo. He's going to get under that tent at 83 and start playing the banjo. And that tent will fill up. Then he'll take the offering. Then he'll preach. Then he'll call people out in the gifts and have blind people see and deaf people hear. And then he'll do it the next night because God didn't just say he'll give you a long life. He'll give you a long, full life. Can I tell somebody tonight, your best years are not behind you. Your best years are still to come. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what, what's with the weakness on healing and protection? Number one, I'd have to say that people have not obeyed God's command to study the Word. Keep the Word ever before you. Meditate on it day and night. I've actually been astounded at how many meetings I've been in in the last two years where the person speaking never even opened their Bible one time. And it's not like they didn't open their Bible because they quoted tons of Scripture. Just never. No Bible. The Bible's the main thing. When Kenneth Hagin taught his final class at Rhema, my cousin was in it. And he said, I was in the Voice of Healing movement. He said, all of my contemporaries that were in the Voice of Healing movement are dead and I'm still alive and preaching the gospel. Do you want to know why? He said, because they all based their ministry on a gift, and I based mine on the word. And I'm going to tell you, he didn't mean that. Like you have to pick the word instead of gifts. But signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word. There's a message that God wants to get out. You can't build your faith on you having a warm feeling at summer camp one time. At an altar meeting, you have to know what the Bible says. I don't think, and I'm not talking about people that don't, denominations that don't believe in healing. I'm talking about full gospel preachers. I don't know if they could quote three, they don't even use scriptures in their, in their messages. Just gonna, hey, hey, bro, just want to share a few thoughts with you today about time management and it, whatever. I've read about five pastors so far, and I'm going to read more. You know why? The more I hear people in my age group and their total disregard for the Bible makes me want to just crack it open and read like chapters of it to people. Because you have a whole generation out there burning down buildings. When they interview them, they don't even know what they're mad about. I, I see that you're protesting. What are you protesting? Nah, nah. Seriously, I have tons of video clips saved where a reporter came and said, what are you protesting about? Police. Yeah, the police is a word. What about the police? I don't like them. Why do you not like them? I don't know. Just angry. Just worked into a frenzy. Because they don't have any word in them. The Bible will change you from the inside out. Because the Bible's a living book. When you teach it to your children, it makes them great. It lets you know you're created in the image of God. It lets you know before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you and had a plan for you. We were watching the Super Bowl. The halftime show came on, and Shakira, who was it on? Uh, J-Lo. Shakira and J-Lo were shaking their butts in front of the camera. My six-year-old daughter pipes up. I don't think this pleases the Lord. 
All right. You make a strong case, Camila. Not sure. She was like 91. Looks up from knitting. I don't think this pleases the Lord. You know, when you get the Bible in you, some stuff just doesn't sit right with you. Nobody has to teach you anything. The Word on the inside of you doesn't let you gel with the spirit of this world. Hey, this Word is going into your spirit. It's not going to return void. It's going to turn you in to a wrecking ball to destroy the gates of hell. If you believe it, let your amen be the loudest. word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no substitute for that book. That book has power. Hallelujah. Man, I heard, I heard Billy Graham say it on a tape set that he did for evangelists when I was 16. He said, I noticed the more scriptures I quoted when I preached, the stronger the response was to receive Jesus. So he said, I covenanted with God to never quote less than 70 scriptures when I preached. So he's preaching in a baseball stadium. He's, you know, people, a lot of people don't even have Bibles. They just came off, you know, they're not, not Christians. So he wants to now turn in your Bible like I'm doing tonight. He just goes, now the Bible says that God so loved the world. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. They just rattle one after another. And I said, I want to go see him at Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. Five people behind me watching, they weren't Christians. You know, I listened to them talk and, you know, they weren't saved. Then by then, they're crying, all of them. The men crying, women crying. He didn't do any kind of theatrics. He wasn't jumping up and down like me. He was almost 70 years old in his J.C. Penney Stafford suit, pointing and quoting scripture, and the word of God is incorruptible seed. I want to challenge, not just for your preaching. I want to challenge you to do what God told Joshua to do. Stay in my word. Keep it ever before you. Meditate on it day and night. And I will give you good success. Put it in there. And when it's needed, it comes out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't know any word on healing. Turn to Psalm 105. It's all through here. God's a healer. It's not like something he does on the side. He's a healer. I am. Not I do, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that healeth thee. If you listen to my decrees, if you do what I tell you to do, none of these sicknesses, not one of them will come upon you. It's like totally foreign to me to hear people talk now. We were in a different time. No, we're not in a different time. We're in the last days. We've been in the last days since Acts 2 because Peter said this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel in the last days. Last days didn't start on March 16th. Last days didn't start when they let a virus out of a bioweapons lab in Wuhan. The last days started in Acts chapter 2 on the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We're coming to the final hour of the last days now before the rapture of the church. And this book works now like it did then. What people are finding out, it's not that we're in a different time. It's that you had a weak faith or Christianity or whatever you want to call it that only worked if the Dow Jones was at 32,000, unemployment was at 3%, and everything was going right. But if you get the real faith in you, if that bubonic plague, I'm, I'm telling you right now, if that bubonic plague, if they can't get it contained, and it turns into a hundred cases and then spreads across here. God forbid. Won't change one thing. Not well, now this one's serious. I don't care if a virus comes out with a 90% kill rate. The Bible says that's the kind the Bible was talking about. If a thousand fall at your one side and 10,000, 10,000 are dying all around you, these evils will not touch you.
It, it really irritates me. Not the clo it's not the closing of churches and stuff. It's the fact that the leaders don't believe the book they're preaching. I have more respect for somebody like Bill Maher on HBO that just says, I think this book's a bunch of what everyone says. I would rather someone just come out and say it than be a pastor and pretend they believe it. I love this book. This book changed my life. I don't understand why you quote Romans 13, that we should obey the law and then still ship Bibles to China and let them break the law. How come, it, how come it's, it's cool for people in another country to have a different kind of faith than it's expected? Oh, that's Africa. That's China. You know, it's not. It's faith. It's the faith that God expects every believer to have. And I'm going to tell you one, one thing that came out of this lockdown. I made up my mind. If I live in a first world country like I do right now, I'm not going to allow that to relax me into some weak first world faith. I'm going to believe God like Peter believed God, like Paul believed God, like they believe him in Nigeria, like they believe him in the townships in South Africa, like they believe him in China. I believe God. I believe his word. And it will be for me just as he said. I believe the Bible. I, I, I give my life for it. I was just looking at the picture before I came up here, all those Coptic Christians back in 2015 in Egypt, all on their knees with ISIS getting ready to cut their head off because they, they wouldn't deny the, the Bible. They said, well, you know, I have a wife and kids. God expects us to use... No. The Bible says there's people in heaven that'll have a martyr's crown. For they love not their lives even unto death. What was Peter doing in prison? Praying? Lord, get me out of here. Lord. He went to sleep. <laughs> Peter, you're being executed in the morning. Okay, what time's the execution? 8.30 a.m. Get me up at 7.45 so I can shower and stuff. <laughs> and God broke him out. I said God broke him out. <laughs> well, we need to be careful. Actually, the Bible says be careful for nothing. Driving at a rock barricade and speeding up is not being careful. Jesus wasn't careful. Jesus was reckless. Hey, um, just so you know, Herod doesn't want you to keep preaching and doing miracles. Oh, he doesn't? Go and tell that fox that I'm going to keep preaching the gospel, casting out devils, and healing the sick until my time has come. That's not careful. They called Peter and John and said, we order you to preach and teach no more in the name of Jesus. And they said, do you think we'd rather obey you than obey God? Just so we can be clear, we would obey God rather than man. And that's the faith, not that I grew up with, that's the Christian faith. Whatever this perversion of it is in America and Canada and Europe, it's not Christianity. There's going to be ministers that go up and stand before God waiting to get shown into their mansion. They're going to say, excuse me, who are you? Oh, I'm brother, I'm Dr. Anderson. I, yeah, you're not on the list, my friend. Oh, you're saying if we shut our churches down, we won't go to heaven? I'm saying it's risky. I want to tell you right now, you're not going to have one to open back up if you don't open it up soon. The sheep will go find a place to eat grass. Did you know, not this month, not this month, last month. They said that 53% of church members have not watched their church's online service one time. They've been watching other places or going other places. And that was in June. You think they're going to sit with you through 2021? We heard there might be a vaccine sometime in the spring. Okay, knock yourself out. The sower sows the word. I, I, like, I got one pastor friend. He just announced during the lockdown. He said our church will be meeting at our regularly scheduled times. 9 a.m., 11 a.m. on Sunday, and 7 p.m. on Wednesday until the rapture of the church. That's it. He said, I'm done. I fell for the 15 days to slow the spread. Now we're in day 108 of make sure there's not any virus living on the earth anymore until we can go on with life. I'm done. You're in the last days. Jesus said there'll be very difficult times. Jesus said he that endures to the end will be saved. You got some, you, it's not 1992. That ship sailed. We're in a time where the devil, the Bible says, knows his time is short. 
and has declared war on the sons of men. All the stuff the Bible prophesied you're seeing happen right now. Getting ready to do away with cash, just like the Bible said. No man can buy or sell without a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. They haven't pushed it here yet, but in Europe, no cash. It's too safe. It's too, it's too unsafe. It spreads the virus. All the stuff. One world government. One world leader. Collapsing of sovereign nations. Everything the Bible said, it's here. You heard Brother Suarez preach a few nights ago. He said his father was from Colombia and was a pastor where communists tried to shut down the church. And he told him, the day will come in America where they try to shut down the church and take your Bible. So that's why he was here. There's two different types of preachers right now. There's ones that know that we're in a spiritual battle and there's one that thinks this is a profession. So glad you could join us for the broadcast of Life of a Champion. This is not a state fair. This is not, we're not motivational speakers. We're not life coaches. There is a devil that's out to steal from a generation, out to kill a generation, out to destroy a generation. Listen, the Bible says about the devil, it is Satan. He is the one who weakens the nations or does destroy the nations or does make the nations sick. The devil has a goal. If you could see in the spirit realm, I'm going to tell you right now, if you could see in the spirit realm, just like Elisha's servant said, there's more with us than there are with them. If you, listen, if you could see those riots, there would be unclean spirits doing the whole thing because it's not even, it doesn't even make sense. I saw a video yesterday of a white Black Lives Matter supporter punching a black person. Somebody explain that to me. Tired of black people being kept down. There's one. got to have an IQ of like 39. A white Black Lives Matter supporter punching a black person. Do you know why? Do you know why none of it makes sense? Black Lives Matter pr protest burned down 41% black owned businesses. Do you know why it doesn't make sense? Because it's demonic. It's a devil that wants everybody dead, whether they're black, white, yellow, brown. But the answer is a Jesus who died for everyone. Black, brown, white, yellow, red. The lamb that was slain for every tongue, every nation, and every race. And you've got to go tell them. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to turn into 1960 all over again. The same crap the devil tried in the 60s. He's only got like five strategies. Doing it again. You know what God did in the midst of that? Anybody ever hear of David Wilkerson? Yeah, God calls a white farm boy from Pennsylvania to get on the back of a flatbed truck in downtown New York City and get a bullhorn and start preaching to the Puerto Rican gangs. And Nicky Cruz goes up to stab him and can't do it because the anointing hits him. He ends up getting a bunch of those gangsters saved. Then they get saved. The blessing of Abraham comes on them. They start prospering. They buy a church in Times Square, one of the most valuable churches on planet Earth, because somebody followed the call of God and said, I'm going. I'm not running from the darkness. I'm running to the darkness with the light. Why is everybody so afraid to die? Your dying is guaranteed. Such a surprise to people. My, my great-grandfather died. Yeah. That's what happens. You think it's a cartoon? Think your grandfather's a video game character? You just press A and he comes. The old Pentecostal songwriter wrote, 
Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Paul, the apostle said, my life has been poured out as an offering to God. You sound, and that's why Paul said it's the foolishness of preaching because you sound insane to people who don't know the Bible. When I died when I was four, when I gave my life to Jesus at four, I actually meant you can have my life. I'm crucified. Jonathan is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me. What did Paul say? Paul say, said, whether I should stay or whether I should go, I don't know. It's better for you if I stay, but it's far better for me if I go to heaven. He didn't care. That's why they put him on trial in the book of Acts. And he starts telling them about the word of God. And, and the judge mocks him and goes, or, or the, the governor he goes, wow, you think I, the way you talk, you feel like you, you, you would make even me become a Christian. And he said, I wish you'd become exactly like me other than these chains. They put him on trial. He didn't try to get off the hook. If people, He said, listen, it's my turn to talk, then let me talk. Jesus changed my life. I was, I was minding my own business going to arrest Christians, and he appeared before me. He changed my name. I went out for years, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, and I saw things in the heavens, and I studied the word and conferred with no man, and then I came back to preach. That's what I, and then he said what, Acts 24, 20? My life is worth nothing unless I use it for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wasn't afraid to die. If there's no word in you, you're easily destroyed. And when there's word in you, <laughs> you're tough to destroy. A demon didn't visit Jesus in the desert. Satan visited Jesus in the desert. Luke chapter 4. And what did Jesus do? Pray and shake his head. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. Probably didn't even speak that loud. It is written. Devil change the subject. It is written. Devil change the subject again. It is written. Devil leave. Devil doesn't have any answer for the word of God. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're engaged in a battle. If you could see in the spirit everything that's going on in Chicago, New York City, Portland, Seattle, you would see demon powers over top of the people. I guarantee you there's people leading that thing, burning stuff down. Burning down statues don't even make sense. They pushed, they burned an elk statue down. It's a freaking elk. It, it, you know, if you, feel, if you feel the source of your oppression is a horned animal, you need therapy. Just angry. There's people there, if you'd, have cast, if you'd cast the devil out of them, they wouldn't even know why they're there. It's a, where am I? Just totally driven by demon power. So how do you fight against it? What's the main weapon God gave us? The sword of the? Which is the? And I'm talking the gospel of Jesus. I'm talking the word with power. I'm not talking about that idiot that went into the chaz with a bullhorn and started yelling at everybody that they're sinners. I'm talking about, I could show you videos of women that went into the same place, started telling people about Jesus. And what the devil does and what Jesus did, everybody just shut up and listen. Because there's authority. The, when you speak the word of God, you're speaking the same thing that God used to frame the world. <laughs> Lift your hands all over this place. Receive a baptism of authority to speak the word of God to your generation. In Jesus' name. If you receive it, shout, I receive it. I receive it. say the word. The word teaches you that you're more than a conqueror. I'm not going to get on a plane and risk my life right now. You know what old Pentecostal preachers believed? They believed that if they got on a plane, they'd infect the atmosphere with the anointing. Anybody ever hear the story of when Smith Wigglesworth got on a commuter train in England? They sat one businessman on his one side and two across on the train, and they were trying to read the paper, and they all started crying. And they said, sir, you convict us of sin. His anointing. You think things can destroy the anointing? If you stay full of the Holy Ghost, everywhere your feet tread, you're on land that God's given you. (laughs) 
Greater is he who lives where? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Than all them that are in the world. If you could see what's going on outside right now, it's driven by demon spirits. But if you'd let God open your eyes into the spirit, you'd say the exact same thing Elisha said. See, there's two groups of people right now. Turn there so you know what story I'm talking about. Turn to 2 Kings. (laughs) Praise God. Go out and find out where Elisha is. Second Kings 6, 13. The king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha's at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha, don't be afraid, Elisha told him. Everybody say, don't be afraid. afraid. Fear is a demon. According to the Bible, God has not given us a, a what? God has not given us an emotion of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And the word in the Greek is literal demonic spirit. What do you think there's all this fighting the last three months? People break an 80-year-old woman's jaw to get a roll of toilet paper. That's a spirit of fear. It turned you into a lunatic. A woman run out of toilet paper. Do you not have a shower? <laughs> Going to knock someone out? It's a spirit. It makes you act like a, like a fool fighting in Costco. People pushing two carts stacked with toilet paper. How many poos do you plan on taking? Everybody say, fear not. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more with us than there are with them. Say it out loud. There's more more with me me than there are against me. Lift your hands and close your eyes. Say it again. There's more more with me me than what's against me. Now with your hands, if you just begin to thank God out of your mouth. There's more with me. Greater is he who lives in me than every power that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've been given the shield of faith which quenches every fiery dart of the devil. I cannot be defeated. I will not give up and quit. He who began a good work in me shall bring it to completion. I'm not going down. I'm going up. God has a plan for me. It's not a plan for failure. It's a plan for prosperity to give me a hope and a glorious future. How many of you are in Bible college? I feel like I just got out of Bible college, but I haven't. I've been out like 18 years now. No meetings to go to. They've, they've all opened up. I told you the story before. I had no meetings getting ready to graduate. And I went to a Brazilian church in Somerville, Massachusetts. 
Couldn't <laughs> understand any of the service, but you could feel the presence of God. Whole thing was in Portuguese. This apostle went there, started a church because the Lord spoke to him in Massachusetts. We're like the average church size is probably like, I don't know, 38 people or so. Full gospel church. He starts one, it goes to about 2,000 in two years. Their youth group, they did it different. You know, they just came straight from Brazil, so they just did it how they did it in Brazil. Youth group was on Friday night, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., which is a great time to have youth group. Time everybody's at the club, they had youth group, they'd have prayer and all that. The youth group was like 700 kids. I went one night. So then I go one night, I feel the presence of God. I got, uh, uh, they didn't have a head set for me. I just, want, I just wanted to sit in the presence of God. So this apostle comes there. He has an evangelist speak from Santa Ana, California. And he's preaching. And I can't understand it. You can just tell he was on fire. Place is packed. They bought like a warehouse and converted it into like a quasi-church. And all of a sudden he points up at my section. And then the ushers come and get me. I thought I was in trouble or something. I was like, man, I was just sitting here. I wasn't misbehaving. And they brought me down to the altar, and the guy points down at me and starts, I could tell he was prophesying. I lifted my hands, I felt the presence of the Lord, and the guy, Otaniel, the translator, is whispering in my ear what he's saying. He said, thus saith the Lord, did I not call you to be an evangelist when you were a boy? He didn't say pastor or preacher, he said evangelist, which is what I was called to be. And as I called you, will I not also open the doors for you? Don't worry. Don't be afraid, for as I've called you, so shall I send you. you know, it was like that, and then I went out under the power. And I came out of that meeting with as many meetings as I had when I walked in, zero. But I had a word from the Lord that the God that started me wasn't going to abandon me along the way. I tell every one of you that are sitting here right now, whether you're in Bible college or not in Bible college, the God that started you on Facebook, on YouTube, you're not going down. I don't care how this year started, the second half of this year will be glorious. The latter shall be greater than all the years before. God hasn't forgotten about you. God's going to continue to open door after door after door. He who began a good work in you shall bring it to completion. I had two, two uh, youth camps call and ask if I'd come do them both in New Brunswick, Canada. Did both of those, went home, no more meetings. Then somebody else called from Maine. Guy in his 60s, hey, were you the speaker that was at the youth camp in New Brunswick, Canada? Man, my grandkids came back, they were different. All three of them got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Would you come and speak at my church for a week? Came and spoke there. Then somebody else that was in the meeting told their pastor, he asked me, come home from that one? No more meetings for the rest of eternity. Then somebody else calls. You keep thinking it's going to run out. I've been waiting for the meetings to run out for 18 years now. Now I've got more, more than I can get to. Then you think the money's going to run out. You get all these stories about how you barely made it there. Then somebody gave you a Pentecostal handshake so you can get home. And then, and then it keeps going. Then it stacks up a little bit. Then you think it's going to run out. You just got on like a little bit of a lucky streak. Here we are almost 20 years later. And the God that started it that night in Somerville, his word never fails. His word never comes back void. It's incorruptible seed. If you believe it, God will do it. I said, if you believe it, God will do it. He that began the good work in you shall bring it to completion. I tell somebody right now, your best days are about to hit this month. No more struggling. No more doing everything you can do just to keep your head above water. No, nah, you're going higher and higher and higher from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. Come on, if you receive that, take 15 seconds and let God hear you. Let him know that he has somebody that believes his word. Say it so the devil can hear you. I'm not going down. I'm going up. There's more with me than there is against me. Now let out a shout and clap those hands one more time. The devil is defeated. I said the devil is defeated. Lord, open his eyes and let him see what I see. And he opened his eyes. God opened his eyes. 
And he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. There's more with us than there are with them. Notice what he said. There's more with us than there are with them. So he saw into the spirit that there are, there were evil forces with them. But there's more with us. What do you think the devil has planned for the second half of this year? I don't give a crap what the devil has planned for the second half of this year. Because the same way it all got beat in the first half of this year, it'll get beat even worse in the second half of this year. This isn't the time for the devil. This is the time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't the time for death. This is the time for life. This isn't the time for darkness. This is the time for light. This isn't the time for spiritual death. This is the time for revival. Revival. I hear the sound of revival. I hear the sound of revival. Do you know why the devil's trying to divide us all by race? Because God's going to do the exact opposite of what the devil's trying to do. God actually doesn't care what color you are. He cares if you're anointed. And he cares if you value the anointing. God sent a white farm kid from Pennsylvania to go reach the Puerto Rican gangs in Times Square, New York. You think because you're black, God's going to send you to reach the black community? God will take your black self and send you to go reach the Amish. You'll be preaching to Amish people with suspenders on with a backwards Yankee hat. And when people look at it from the outside, they'll say, this doesn't make sense. And you know what happens when it doesn't make sense? God gets all the glory. Because they have to admit, God must have given that man favor. God must have given that woman favor. These people don't even like women. These people don't even like black people. These people don't even like white people. But they'll make an exception for you because the favor of God is on your life. And it'll bring glory to God. Everybody say, I'm anointed. Yeah, when you're anointed, it opens doors for you that otherwise wouldn't open. Anybody ever seen my sidekick, Evangelist Kofi, from Ghana? He's not brown, he's black. He came to preach with me one out in the country. I think it was in Indiana, like country, country. Bunch of people got saved when he got done preaching. This old guy came up to me, very nonchalant. He said, you know what? I've never even liked black people my whole life, but I like him, and I, I just don't feel that way anymore. He got saved. Listen, he doesn't, that's what God will do. God will send somebody, like he'll send Jonah to Nineveh. He'll send Ninevites to reach Jonah-type people. He'll break down all those stupid walls that society. If the devil had his way, he'll break us down into tribes, not just white people and black people. He'll get you into, like, individual white people, Irish against English, Scottish against Welsh, Ghanaian against Nigerian, the black people who came from Africa to the black people that were born in America. If the devil has his way, it won't stop at color. You'll have people fighting over every, who has a long nose, who has a short nose, last name, family background. I mean, you already see it right now. You have black people on social media telling other black people, you're not a real black person. There are people killing everybody. If the devil has his way, he'll break it all down into tribes fighting each other. But if Jesus gets his way through us, every tongue, every black, 
every brown, every orange, every yellow, every white, no matter what their nation, no matter what their language, they'll all be together under one roof with their hands lifted, lifting up the lamb that was slain for every tongue, every tribe, every nation, and every race. And that's how it's going to go. Because there's more with us than there are with them. God will send an 83-year-old man to a 100-degree place under a tent in a state where you're not allowed to have any gatherings over 10 people. And you watch what he'll do with his meeting. He'll blow that thing up. You know why? Because he's anointed. That guy studies so much and is so just plays the banjo and studies the Bible, he probably doesn't even know there's a virus going around. Just sitting in his room reading the Bible. Think how different your life would be right now if you didn't watch TV or have social media the last four months. America's being burned to the ground. Not out my window, it's not. Can you say Amen. It's a nation of 330 million people. You can shine a microscope anywhere. Find some bad place. Find some person that assaulted another person. That's not America. God's not finished with this country yet. I've been saving all the good videos on my phone. People hugging police officers. Well, there's real racial tension in America. Couldn't tell in this meeting. Looks like the United Nations in here. There's real division. Not here, there's not. Because when the Holy Ghost comes in, you don't care what color anybody is. When you get drunk in the Holy Ghost, you like everybody. Real Christians have so much love. I've, I was raised in church. It freaks me out still. People you never met, hey. I don't even hug my dad. Who are you? I'm the children. We just need to get people dialoguing. No, we need revival. You know, there, there's a guy that Pastor uh, Rodney and I have listened to on social media. I listen to him a lot. He's not a Christian. Tells you on the broadcast he's not a Christian. But, he, you know, he doesn't have, like, mean stuff to say about Christians. You know what he said on his broadcast last night? Man, I feel this thing. Praise God, Brother Derek. He said, he said as I've told you on this many times, he's, he's like a psychologist, multimillionaire business guy in his 60s. He said, as I've told you before, I'm not a believer. He said, I don't have any problem with believers. He said, if that, if that helps you get through life, whatever. He said, but I'll tell you what, these last few months, even I've noticed that people are like off base spiritually. And he said, it's almost as if America needs some kind of revival. <laughs> spiritually. And he was talking like our kind of revival. I thought, okay. If a psychologist is saying, you know, I've been looking over the scene. America needs a revival. <laughs> then it's high time. If I was on the street team at River University, I, I'd go to the worst place I'd go and just let it rip. Pray. See the power of God hit people. Because America's going to have a revival. You know why? Because there's more with us than there are with them. You know another reason we're going to have a revival? The Bible says it's time for a revival. It says that God's last day plan is for the Holy Ghost to be poured out on all flesh. So actually, when you start pushing in that direction, <laughs> you don't need anybody to give you a prophetic word because Joel already gave you one. And you're actually getting right in the flow. You know, it's like instead of trying to create your flow, your own flow, just find out where God is interested in, in going and doing. And you get in that. And, and a wind will just carry you. Carry you financially, open doors for you. Jesus said, I'll open a door for you, and when I open it, nobody can shut it. And I'll shut doors, and when I shut them, nobody can open them up. 
Every door the devil's opened into your life, Jesus shuts it tonight, and it'll never come open again. I tell you right now. Every door of sickness that's been opened into your family where it's like it just, somebody's always sick, somebody always needs treatment. In Jesus' name, that door is shut permanently now. Every open door of poverty could never get ahead. Something always going wrong, something always broken. In the name of Jesus, that door called poverty is shut for the rest of your life now. <laughs> he said, when I shut a door, nobody can open it back up. And he said, when I open a door, nobody can close it again. The door of healing is opened into your family now in Jesus' mighty name. Healing will never leave your life. Hey, that lady in the back in the gray shirt, lift both hands. Be filled right through you in Jesus' mighty name. The door of prosperity. The door that when it opens overflows your cup. That door is opened unto you tonight in Jesus' mighty name. You'll never lack open doors. You'll never have to call somebody for help. God will open doors for you and no one can shut them. Receive it in Jesus' name. T Turn to Matthew chapter 9. I had eight points in my message tonight. Number one was the word, and that's, I guess, all we're going to get. This lady in the pink, just go around to the aisle. Power of God's all over you. I'm going to pray for people tonight. I'm going to pray for people online tonight. Quit watching negative news. Quit sharing negative stories on your, and focusing on that. Start getting your eyes on what Jesus is doing and get your eyes off of what the devil's trying to do. He failed on all of it anyway. Be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. More, more. This guy in the White River shirt. Just go over to the aisle. We love you, Lord Jesus. Just lift your hands wherever you are and begin to thank God that he's not through blessing you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless this city of Tampa. Father, put your hand on the leadership of this city. Protect the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department. Let there not be one ambush killing, traffic stop shooting. Protect them in Jesus' name. Send angels to be around those in leadership in this city. Revive our land in Jesus' mighty name. Lift your hands up even higher as you do the fire of God comes upon you. This will be a turning point in your life like it was for me that night in Somerville. Filled in Jesus' mighty name. Go right through you. More, more, more in Jesus' mighty name. Matthew chapter 9. If you're there, can you say amen? amen. I'm going to tell you what the Lord spoke to my spirit. The Holy Ghost is a quickening spirit. <laughs> Give you energy. 
83-year-old man can't preach a tent meeting, 125 degrees under the tent, lead worship himself, preach himself, take the offering himself, and pray for the sick for a week. But you can when, you, when, when you're anointed. You can outrun a king's chariot. You can run through a troop and leap over a wall. This lady in the gray, yeah, just stand up. You don't even have to come to the house. Just lift both hands. Put one hand on your belly. Lift the other one up to the Lord. God heals you from the inside out and anoints you with fresh oil right now. In Jesus' mighty name, go right through you. There it is. More? Yeah. You'll never be the same. You're going to have the best year you've ever had. <laughs> Hallelujah. When your girlfriends talk about what a crappy year 2020 was, you'll just have to pretend. Nod your head. You're going to have the best six months you've ever had in Jesus' mighty name. This lady, young lady with the blonde braid, stand up. Come right around. Whichever way is quickest. You can come this way. Yeah. Just lift your hands. Close both eyes. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues. Everybody say teaching. teaching. Almost all the tent meetings in the United States that shook America, they taught in the day and they preached at night. Because that's what Jesus did. He taught, then preached, and then healed. Everybody say healed. healed. And so when the message is over, it's not over. Preaching's not an end to itself. You don't give a message, leave it on a high, and hand the mic back to somebody to close the service out. You're... you're Speaking, according to the Apostle Paul and the way Jesus ministered, is supposed to flow in to the demonstration of whatever you preached. You preach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, people should get baptized. This lady in the tie-dye shirt with the Jesus hat on? Just stand up. Lift your hands right there. I tell you, the Lord heals your blood and the organs of your body right now. In Jesus' name. From tonight, you're whole. No infirmity, no weakness. In Jesus' name. You're going to wake up the strongest you've ever, you've ever been waking up. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus is real. I'm a preacher's kid. Also, my grandfather was a preacher. I promise you if this was fake, I would have never, ever got involved. I won't even go to church. I never. The same way my dad was when he preached, he was at home. He prayed for me at home. We had family devotions. <laughs> my dad and mom just celebrated whatever years of marriage, 42 or something, a couple days ago. Build our house on the Bible. You build your life on this book, God won't hang you out to dry. God will build things for you. This lady in the second row, just come right around. Power of God's all over you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Feels good to be a Christian. Feels good not to have any fear. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of what shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. What can any man do to me? Psalm 27, 1 to 3. It's true. In Jesus' name. Go right through you. Take it. You mind if I pray for you in the pink? Come right around. What state are you from? I like Texas. Nice to meet you. Lift both hands to the Lord. Put one hand on your belly and then put the other hand on your heart. 
God gives you a brand new bloodstream tonight. That'll extend your life. You won't have any kind of chronic health problem. You'll live out your days healthy and strong. I see the Lord just lift. Like I'm sure you're strong. But the Lord lifts an infirmity out of you that will cause you problems down the line. You'll never have problems. You'll never be the same from tonight. You're going to have the best life. God's going to help you. Everyone say, God's going to help me. The Bible says he's a very present help in time of trouble. So if you're in trouble, it's not like you've got to get everything straightened out and then come back to the Lord when everything's in the clear. <laughs> if you read the ministry of Jesus, people just kept flinging themselves at him when they were in trouble. Lepers flinging themselves. Demon-possessed people flinging themselves. <laughs> He'll help you when, when you're going through a rough time. He's a burden-bearing Jesus. He's a good shepherd. He lifts the heavy burdens. He destroys the yoke of bondage. He'll destroy the thought of suicide out of your head. <laughs> if you try to think about it again, it won't even come back. It'll fly away like a bird. You'll never see it again. You're not going to die. You're going to live and declare the goodness of the Lord while you're yet in the land of the living. <laughs> Let me see your right hand. I know in my spirit the enemy already tried to take your life several times. Before you were born, shortly after you were born, and then as an adult. But I have preserved you, says the Lord. And my hand has kept you for such a time as this. And now I will use you to glorify my name. In Jesus' name. Every plan the devil has fails. When I was growing up in church, they used to say, if, if you skip to the back of the book, you see we win. You don't even have to skip to the back. Make about Genesis 3. Satan fails. Genesis 6, fail. Just keep failing. Even when he launches his grand plan with the Antichrist, that lasts seven years, and the wheels start falling off after about the three-and-a-half-year mark. He's a professional screw-up. His main plan was nailing Jesus to the cross. How'd that work out? The Bible says, had he known what he was doing, he never would have nailed the Son of God to that cross because he thought when he killed him, his problems were over. But when he nailed Jesus to the cross, his problems were just beginning. When he shed his blood, it broke the hold of the devil over mankind. And then he rose three days later, triumphant over sin and death, and took the keys of authority out of his hand and holds them for the church. And now we are more than conquerors. Can I tell you something tonight? Congratulations. You're not trying to get the victory. You already have the victory through your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on. Let the devil hear you. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God. The devil is defeated. I said the devil is defeated. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And he healed every kind of sickness and disease. Say healed. healed. Every kind every of sickness and disease. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the field. Will you search the scripture for me? It's in James, but I've got to find exactly where it's at. You have your phone? Just put in, um, husbandman, precious fruit. I think it's James too. I don't want to waste people's time. James 5, 7. Dear brothers, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Well, that translation butchered it. Was this, you have anybody have a King James or New King James? Who? Just stand up and read it loud. One more time. Here. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Everybody say early and latter rain. Early and latter rain. So the early rain prophetically was, was Acts 2 in the upper room, and the latter rain is what we're in now. The move of the Holy Ghost across the whole earth. The glory of the Lord cover on the earth as the waters cover the sea. The Bible says he has long patience for the fruit of the earth till he's received the early and the latter rain. He has patience for the precious fruit of the earth. The precious fruit of the earth is souls. Jesus said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to ask him to send more workers to come out into the field. The thought that God dropped in my spirit. See, the thing I had trouble reconciling about the whole lockdown is if the whole reason Jesus hasn't come back yet is so people have time to be saved. And then now, they were saying in March and April, we're never going to be able to have mass meetings again. Which that's gone. You know, even Major League Soccer is selling tickets July 11th to a game in Salt Lake City. They're not filling the stadium, but they're selling f a little over 5,000 seats in a 20,000 seater. So you have stand-up comedians starting to hold meet, uh, their meetings, 400, 600 people. And so that lifted. We were supposed to never be able to do something like this again. I mean, you know, Pastor Rodney went to jail for doing this. There's a, you're never, it's going to be a new normal, no meeting. So I thought, well, if the Lord's waiting for some people have time to get saved, what sense does it make? that we're going to be on earth and you can't, you can't hold meetings. And you can't reach people, you can't reach that many unsafe people on the internet because Facebook does an algorithm where it only shows your broadcast to people that have similar interests. That's why you can teach on the Bible for two hours and not have any negative comments. If it was reaching everybody, you'd have tons of like middle finger emojis and stuff. <laughs> so I thought, what sense does it make that God, knowing that the only reason he's waiting is so people have time to be saved and to bring in the fruit of the earth and the church is going to be incapacitated. Can't meet. Well, you already saw that that lift, but I'll tell you the thing that God dropped in my spirit today. Anytime you look through history, particularly re recently, and there was a shutdown of international travel, like you take World War II, shutdown of international travel. I know preachers that were friends of our family, they're in heaven now. They were preaching overseas. You have to go home. Get out of England Hitler's headed this way. Anybody that's not an English national has to be out of here. Couldn't travel and hold meetings overseas. But then as soon as World War II lifted, that's when the, the tent revivals went across America and God made up for what the locust and the canker worm took. So whatever time the enemy has stolen right now, where the church can't meet, church can't sing, <laughs> we ask you to keep your voices down, you know, can't preach, can't sing. Don't, please don't take communion. Please no water baptism, please. Uh, we're going to allow you to meet no more than 10. Well, the difference between not being able to meet and meeting with no more than 10 is very minuscule. So if, if Satan had a success in shuttering that, 
You know, Pastor Rodney, 300 city tour, can't, can't move right now. Then I'm going to tell you, and you can remember I said it, that when this thing lifts soon, God is going to make the devil pay even for the time that was taken. As quickly as this virus came, so shall a third great awakening come, not only on America, but on the nations of the earth. I know that. There's a separation of the wheat and tares. And if, you got to be, if you're still a wheat and you're watching and you're a minister, you're going to stop asking questions like, how can we get more people to come? And you're going to start asking questions like, where did all these people come from? Because when people weren't allowed to travel and preach during World War II, as soon as it lifted, they couldn't build tents big enough to hold the people. Build a 12,000-seat tent and still have to keep the flaps up on the side and seat another 10,000 people outside of it. And that was when the population was like half of what it is right now in the United States. Now I'm going to tell you, these buildings that football teams think they built for football, baseball teams think they built for baseball, hockey teams think they built for hockey, they're going to find out that God used heathen money to build state-of-the-art arenas and stadiums to hold the crowds that will come in to hear the gospel <laughs> in this last hour of time. And I got better news for you than that. You're not going to watch it happen. God's going to anoint you tonight, and you're going to make it happen in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you receive that, stand on your feet and just give the Lord the greatest hand clap and shout that you've ever given anybody. God's going to use you. God's going to use you. Say, say it out loud. I'm alive, I'm alive. for such a time as this. <laughs> I know back in March and April, we were all thinking, man, I wish I would have died in like 2011. <laughs> but that's not how things are going to end. God actually has you around. He saved the best for last. <laughs> and if you'll, if you'll hook up with the anointing, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, What's never entered into the heart of man. That's what God has reserved for those who love him. Who's the guy with his hands lifted in the back? Lift your hands up even higher. As you do, the fire of God comes on you even stronger. <laughs> Lift your hands one more time. Everybody that's watching online, I loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost into your homes. Those of you li that live in countries where your churches couldn't meet, still can't meet, loneliness has set in, depression has set in. Maybe you've even allowed an addiction to come in or something. I curse that work of the enemy to destroy your soul. I loose the presence of God into your room to rescue you in Jesus' name. You've been hearing me preach for over a month now. You know I'm not in the habit of doing this. But I tell you, even those that are in this room that have mothers that don't know the Lord, fathers who don't know the Lord, siblings that don't know the Lord, that if Jesus were going to come back right now, they'd miss heaven. God's not going to have you run around the world leading other people to the Lord while your own family goes to hell. Your family is coming home quickly. In Jesus' mighty name. Kubroshte gindi ana mabrakutia. Undo rekiti araba brokosto. If you're filled with the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. Hey, 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Toshte bandi anama brogosta kati. Brondo yekiti arabogost. Undo remandi arabo. Father, let the tide turn on this thing. Hallelujah. This lady in the second row in the black with the blonde hair. Lift your hands up even higher. You don't have to come out. Close both eyes. Be still. Go right for you. There. More in Jesus' name. You'll never be the same. Every closed door like I had getting ready to come out of Bible college and the Lord opened it in one night and it's never been shut. That door is opened unto you now in Jesus' name. Say out loud, I'll never lack open door. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, and if you're watching online tonight and you need to make things right with God, maybe during these last hundred days, nobody in this generation has ever been through anything like we all went through. I mean, it wasn't even like what it actually turned out to be. It was the projections and predictions in March and April. You know, that one expert said every hospital bed will be full in the United States by May 8th. I was reading one yesterday that by... The prediction was, what's today, the, the 6th? On July 5th in Minnesota, they projected there'd be 700 people dying a day. Just in Minnesota. And it, it's like, I think like there was like one yesterday in the state, maybe none. So people were just freaked out. You know, I mean, I, even in my house, we have a brand new fr big freezer filled with frozen foods that we've never eaten. You look like, it was, you know, then you had all these rumors online. They're going to knock the power out, the online's out. There's not even going to be allowed to be interstate travel, all that stuff. So people were freaked out. So maybe during that time, you allowed that fear. Fear never opens the door to good things. Fear opens the door to the devil. Maybe you coped with that with alcohol or some type of prescription pill or street drug and you're a slave to it tonight you, you need to get free you develop some kind of addiction during these last 108 days that that thing has a hold on you now it's like a boa constrictor wrapped around you you're going to kill you if you don't let Jesus break its hold on your life I want to call you to receive Jesus Christ both online and here there's only one thing that can break the hold of that snake it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And I can't call on him for you. You have to call on him to be saved. He that believes with his heart and confesses with his mouth. If I could confess for everybody, I'd do it. I'd just wake up at 8 in the morning and go to bed at midnight and just confess on behalf of other people. I wish you could do it like they teach you in other religions. Me just light candles for you and stuff. It'd be a lot easier. I'd never leave home. Just get candles shipped in on Amazon and light them for people. But people have to hear the gospel and then they make a choice either to reject it or to receive Christ. That's how it goes. Those are the rules. So if you're here tonight, online or live or on TV, and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or you once did, and during these hectic three and a half months, things went haywire and you need to come back to the Lord. You're not living on fire for God. You're living lukewarm at best. You allowed something to come in and mess up your relationship with God, but you can come back tonight. 
But I don't know how many tonights there's going to be. There's no guarantee there's going to be a tomorrow night. Jesus could come at any time. And when he comes, you can't get ready. You have to be ready all the time. The Bible says two will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. If you're here and you need to either receive Jesus Christ for the very first time or you've received him but you fell away and you need to come back, I want you to quickly come out of your seat and join me at the altar right now. We're going to pray. Come quickly in Jesus' name. Slip out of your seats. If you're in the middle, they'll let you out, but come. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Hey, God bless you. Hallelujah. Keep clapping. Worth clapping for. God bless you, sir. If you're on your way, you can keep coming. Just make sure you're here before I finish praying. Those of you that are in front of me, lift both hands to the Lord. I'll give you the words to say, but say them from your heart to God. That's what praying is. There's a real God that hears this prayer, and he does his work on the inside of you even while you're praying it. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. I admit that I've sinned. I repent. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Right now, I receive forgiveness. I receive salvation. In Jesus' name. Keep your hands lifted. Let me bless you. Father, I thank you that your word says... In Isaiah 10, 27, that the anointing lifts the heavy burden and destroys the yoke of bondage. Any heavy burden that they've carried, maybe something that nobody even knows about, I thank you that your anointing lifts it off of their shoulders now. They just feel lighter. They're not carrying that anymore. And in the same name of Jesus, everything the devil used to try to bind their life, destroy them, I thank you that it's broken now, and they're free. For he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I thank you for that. I give you the praise. I give you the honor and the glory. Thank you for seven new brothers born into our family. In Jesus' name. Welcome to the family of God. Just so you know, before we're going to give you something from the church that you'll like, but uh, we're meeting every night from now till God knows when. It's been 35 straight nights, so 6.30, and it's, uh, every night's free to come. And we'd love to have you every night you can make it. If you can't make it right at 6.30 because of work or whatever, you can't make it till 8, there's a good chance the service will still be going on at 8 o'clock. So just come. If you have to come straight from work or whatever, no big deal. Most nights it's outside. So, uh, welcome to the family of God. See this guy from Massachusetts, from Attleboro? Just follow him. He's going to give you a gift from the church before you, before you turn back. Give them a hand clap as they head that way. We love you. Come on, give them a big hand clap. Lift your hands where you're standing. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that the second half of this year that we're in right now, it won't be calamity after calamity. It'll be miracle after miracle. No more ups and downs, just ups and ups. The last defeat that you've ever seen in any area of life be the last defeat you've ever, you'll ever see. From this day forward, you not only walk in victory, you carry victory. My God will protect you from tonight. My God will deliver you from tonight. From every trap laid by the enemy. You won't fall in it one time. 
and the one that digs the trap will fall into it instead of you. With your hands lifted, everybody that needs housing or adequate housing. You have a place to sleep, but it's, it's, it's not adequate for the size of your family or whatever. In Jesus' name, I loose. I put my faith in agreement with yours for adequate, good housing. In Jesus' name. Where you don't have to go to sleep to nine millimeter fire every night. In Jesus' name. Where you don't have to pretend you don't see things crawling out of the corner of your eye. In Jesus' name. Everybody get their own bed. In Jesus' name. Plenty of food. For God's word declares you will eat in plenty. And you'll never have an empty refrigerator. You'll never have to be creative into how you make your meals for your kids. In Jesus' name. I thank you for it, Lord, and I give you praise. And every sickness and disease that's here, you're already healed by the word of God. And no more bouts with sickness and disease. For if you put away the idols of this land and serve only me, I will bless your bread and water and I will take sickness out of your midst. The last sickness you saw will be the last one you ever see. In Jesus' name. All God's people said amen. Well, somebody shout praise the Lord. Be seated briefly. We're going to do one of the most important things in the meeting. Then we're going to sing on behalf of our brothers and sisters in California. Luke chapter 6. Now, you know what? I'm going to call an audible. Go to Psalm 103. Praise God. How many of you saw that Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, the Chaz in Seattle? You know, on July 1st, when the mayor ordered it cleared out, and they cleared it out without any resistance, when I saw that video, I just felt that was like a picture of what the month's going to be, that that spirit is getting cleared out of America, and then right behind it's going to follow the move of God. America needs help. And the church is the one to help. Otherwise, all you can do is pass laws to punish people for doing wrong. You can't change them into people who don't want to do wrong. You just catch them. But Christ puts a new law on people where the person who was driven to do wrong now doesn't want to do wrong anymore. Psalm 103, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. Say it out loud. He forgives all my sins. And the Bible says he heals all my diseases. Say it out loud. He heals all my diseases. The Bible says he redeems me from death and he crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. So the offering part deals with the filling your life with good things part. God didn't say he'd meet your needs. He said he'd fill your life with good things. The Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
You have people when you start preaching, they say, are you one of those health and wealth preachers? Well, I'm not a poverty and sickness preacher. Is that what you want me to preach to you? How many of you are having a hard economic time? Well, it's going to get worse. No. The Bible says when Elijah found out that that lady hardly had anything left in her house, that he multiplied what was there and what wasn't enough became more than enough for the rest of the famine. God is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. So really, if you read the Bible and believe it, and you don't run it through an American filter or seminary filter, you just read it as written, it's hard not to be a health preacher because God didn't say, I'm Jehovah, and if you serve me, I'll make you super sick. He said, if you serve me, I'll keep sickness and disease away from you. Then Jesus, you actually won't find one place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John where Jesus laid his hand on a healthy person and made him sick. Jesus found a little kid running around and then gave him leprosy. You don't read that. He found the sick and made them well. And then when Christ came on the scene and there was insufficiency of anything, he made more than enough Everybody ate until full and there was plenty left over. Peter hadn't caught anything all night. And then the baskets were full of fish. But then the Bible tells you there's another level of it where he'll fill your life with good things. I don't know the first thing about cars. Even on video games, I have to drive an automatic car. I don't even know how to do the gears like with the buttons. So my wife is different. My wife's dad is a mechanic. And he's, he's a, about 75 now and still is a, is a mechanic. He's got huge hands. When he shakes my hand, his fingers go to like here. He's a big mechanic. And uh, my wife likes cars. She's wired like him. She knows how to fix them. She knows the parts that are needed. I own no toolboxes. My wife owns two, two toolboxes. I don't know how to fix anything. Pe people think this is a joke when I say it. One time, our toilet, when we first got married, our toilet quit working. I was just going to move. I didn't even know how you fix it. My wife took the top of the toilet off. I was like, I didn't know that came off. There's all that stuff in there. She said, how did you think it flushed? Uh, honestly, in 23 years, I never thought about it one time. I thought it was like magic or something. But you push the thing and it swirls. That's a true story. So she came and fixed it. Well, anyway, my wife likes cars a lot. And, uh, she needed a car. We had one leased. The lease is about up. And she told her twin sister and a few of the other girls in the office, I would love to get a Mustang that's like tricked out. And I'm telling you, the first or second week I was here, a guy drove over from the other coast of Florida. My wife told, my wife told me and her twin sister and a couple of the girls that were there. That was it. We didn't put it on Facebook, praying for a Mustang. Nothing like that. No GoFundMe for Adonis's Mustang. Never said a word about it. But the Lord must have heard her. This guy drives across in a Mustang that him and his dad had been working on since 2005, all tricked out with rims and a different engine, makes too much noise, all that stuff. My wife's going to be... So then he brings it over. He drives it over. He, he told me, I want to give something to you. And so he pulls up in that car and I'm waiting for him to give me something. He went, this is it. He said, the Lord spoke to me to give you this car. He said, and when I saw it, I thought, he didn't speak to you to give it to me. He spoke to you to give it to my wife because I could see it was a stick shift. And if it was for me, it was going to last about 100 feet. <laughs> if he gave it to me, it had to call a tow truck at entrance three. <laughs> And so I called Adonis over. I said, hey, Adonis, the Lord spoke to this guy to give you something. And so she came over and said, what is this? And he said this and pointed at the car. And man, her eyebrows went up like a cartoon character. It's like above her head. <laughs> That's not a need. That's God said. He, David said he fills my life with good things. Because remember, David started as the lowest in his family. And when he was done, he was king of Israel with a palace and all that. And how did he get it? By praising God, by honoring God. And the last thing he did that we have record of in the Bible is he cleared out his private treasury. And I wanted to tell you this online tonight, and I wanted to tell you this here. This is the kind of thing that when a preacher tells you and you have like $61 in your bank account, you feel like punching him in the face. Oh, I'm glad your wife got a car. If I wasn't saved, I'd punch you right in the face. 
and take your car. It's the last thing you want to hear. But what I'm trying to tell you is God's not a liar because I've been in that place. I've been in the place where we miscalculated and overdrew our bank account when we were first married by like $300. We not only didn't have any money, we couldn't qualify for any credit cards and we were minus $300 in the bank. Can't get a thing from st stupidity and mismanagement. You know, had to make whatever mozzarella sticks from Costco last the rest of the month. I know all that. But where you are now is not where you finish. If you honor God with your best, God not only promised to meet your need, he not only promised to take care of your housing and your food and your clothing, he said he'll give you the desires of your heart. My wife got the car she liked. My wife's going to be driving a, a car that like an 18-year-old troublemaker drives. It's loud. It has rims. I have a feeling she's on Amazon right now looking for a Puerto Rican flag rear view mirror hanger. So if you see a lady with hoop earrings drive by your house tonight blasting pit bull, I'm not saying it's my wife, but it may be my wife. No. <laughs> Octavia knows. So, everybody say, he fills my life with good things. And, ah, that, that stuff doesn't mean anything to me. Well, then God won't fill your life with it. It'll do it as something that you want. Actually, it doesn't mean anything to me either. If somebody gave me a Mustang with a stick shift, it'd be, it'd, it'd be less than useless. I can't drive stick at all. But she can, and she prefers driving stick. She knows how to do all that stuff, like drift and all that. I don't know what she did before she got saved, and I'm not asking. <laughs> I'm just very respectful to her. But there is something you like. And as you honor God, God is a good father. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 11, if you fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to all who ask? So do you know what happens? God put a foolproof system in place. Give and you shall receive. Because people that don't believe this in church, they say, like, yeah, but then, then that'll take the place of God. That's why God put a plan in place that you give to receive. As soon as it takes God's place, you quit giving, and that's the sign that you've checked out of the agreement. But as long as God keeps saying that the money only has a place in your hand and not in your heart, then God keeps, once God sees he can get the blessing through you, he'll never stop getting blessing to you. That's a fact. And so the offering, you prove to God that you can let go of money, because most people can't. Most people will beat people over their money and steal things that don't belong to them. So when you give it an offering, you show God you're different. Not only will I not take what doesn't belong to me, I'm willing to take what I have and give it to you as a sign that I believe your word. And God said, when you give, you shall receive. Yeah, that wasn't written in America. Jesus said that. Give and you shall receive. Press down, shaken together and running over, I will cause men to give liberally into your bosom. So your only job is to ask the Lord what he'd have you to give. He gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So you ask the Lord, what, everything that's in your life isn't bread. Something is seed. Something is your key to going from where you are now to the level God has for you to be at, which is high. And you unlock it by not eating your seed. You sow your seed. What's your seed? The Bible says, let each man give as he's directed by the Spirit, not reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so hold your hand up for an offering envelope, and they'll pass one out to you. If you're watching online, they're going to put in information at the bottom of the screen for you to give. The easiest way is to go to revival.com and click invest. Invest in the gospel. Make checks payable to River, River Ministries International. I want to challenge everybody on YouTube and Facebook to not be a bystander, to get involved. You know, giving is working with your faith in the financial realm with God. And this, this place, this is not my ministry. So I'm not saying this with any kind of bias. This is one of the few active soil places you can sow. 
that's reaching people in person with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I really have a good feeling about this month. That thing I saw about when they cleared the chat, I really felt like that was like a symbol for the month. There's 3,114 counties in the United States, I think. It might be 3,141, somewhere around there. And there's only 52 counties that, that don't have a decrease in COVID-19 activity. So it's almost dried up. A couple of hot zones. We'll pray those out. Don't want anybody to die or get sick. But we certainly didn't hit every hospital bed full. And most states are dropping off the, the map. I think yesterday was 209 deaths reported in the nation, which was down from the Sunday before, which is down, it was actually the lowest reported deaths since March 22nd. So that's why you hear all the focus in the media on cases. But the virus has mutated considerably weaker than where it was at. I'm not speaking in faith. I'm telling you what, what virologists and epidemiologists say. It's not the same that it was when it first hit. Viruses mutate weaker, not stronger. And it's much weaker now than it was then. So it's not as deadly. Like you saw when it hit New York, you know, when it first hit, you had, you had 38 year old paramedics in perfect health getting knocked out and killed. But it's not like, it's not happening to that degree. The infection fatality rate is like 0.4%, something like that. Weighed down. So we got about 25 hot zones county wise, 25 counties Texas, Arizona, a couple in California on the border, and a couple in Florida. So pray for those and see this thing get its rear end out of the country once and for all. But I'm happy to see it subsiding. 209 deaths in the country. Lowest since March 22nd or 23rd, right, right when it was starting to, to hit. So it's trending in the right direction. Austria just did away with all masks, all social distancing, and uh, all restrictions. So Europe, UK reported no deaths yesterday. New York, for the first time, reported no deaths. Northeast is about, you know, it swept through the population. So once it does, you hit herd immunity and, and uh, it gets better. So we're on the other side of it for sure. Now you won't know that from watching the news, but remember what I've told you like every night. Anytime somebody only talks to you about cases and doesn't speak about hospitalizations or deaths, you're being manipulated. You don't want cases. You obviously want the thing to disappear. But like you had one place, it was migrant workers. They tested 92. And all 92 tested positive. None of them even had one symptom. Nobody even had a runny nose or anything. So just because somebody has COVID-19 doesn't mean they're, you know, they talk about cases. You think everybody's sealed in a plastic room. Most of the cases now are asymptomatic. The more good news I share about COVID-19, the more serious you look. I almost feel like it's people who are rooting for COVID. You must work for CNBC's morning financial show.
going to be a good second half of the year. Stand on your feet, everybody. Hold your seat up to the Lord. If you're at home watching, participate with us. Hold up your whatever you used to give to the Lord. Say this out loud. Father, Father as, I this seed, as I sow this seed, I do it in faith. I, it in faith. I believe for increase. I believe for, I believe for blessing. I believe for, blessing. I believe for overflow. I believe, for overflow. I, believe your word I believe your word that says I will lend only. I'll never borrow. I pray, Father, that you would make me someone who's a blessing, someone who's never in need, someone who only meets needs. In Jesus' name. Guys, you can line the buckets up across the front, or you're going to pass them. How many of you have been blessed tonight? Well, good. Don't let this band do all your praising for you. We're going to praise for us and on behalf of all our friends out in California. So go ahead and bring your seat, and we'll see you tomorrow night at 630. Don't miss it. God bless every one of you in Jesus' name.